All right, let us begin. Om, welcome all of you to our monthly Ayurveda workshops. So this group started last year as a way to just create community around, particularly around conversations that help regulate the nervous system from an Ayurvedic perspective. And also we bridge into a lot of the work that I do with my one-on-one -on -one clients ends up being around trauma healing and resolving imprints from early childhood um, and that those types of things that end up creating or complicating physical health ailments. So we do deep work to get to the root of those. So I started these workshops last year with, with all of you, many of you that are still with us today, um, but primarily around Ayurvedic psychology and diving deeper into those topics of trauma healing and Ayurveda. And particularly they've been very useful for people who identify as highly sensitive nervous systems, highly sensitive empaths, empathic types, and, um, and those who are struggling with various maybe chronic challenges or stubborn health conditions that just, they have a, an inkling that there's something emotional at its root. But what we do in the approach is very holistic. So we look at the physical health, we look at the mental, emotional, spiritual sides. And when we look at interpersonal dynamics and all kinds of things. So that's just a little background on where these workshops started. But then this year we just started up again and um, we're diving into, I've kind of outlined our, our monthly first Wednesdays of each month um, content for the next several months. And a lot of it is based on your feedback, things that you've um, messaged in, in the chat and written me in personal messages and emails. And um, I wanted to, to zoom out and revisit this bigger picture overview of the pillars of healing. And these are pillars of healing that are particular to regulating the nervous system and optimizing health all around. Um, but they're also guidelines for how to really feel safe in your body, how to feel at home in your body, especially if your body's been in an uncomfortable place due to physical challenges or also due to just mental, emotional things. You know, there's a lot. Um, I personally struggled with a dissociative disorder. So there was this kind of hypervigilance in my system. And I didn't know for many years that I had this going on. All I knew is that I had pain and the pain brought me back into my body, but then it was so uncomfortable that I'd kind of just check out. And so it kind of felt like this oscillation between being really disconnected from my body and feeling really numb and then being in the body either in a very comfortable way or a very uncomfortable way. And so this oscillation can happen for many of us, especially living in a hypervigilant society that's very fear-based, um, especially with intergenerational imprints of our ancestors and of the very land that we live on, that um, trauma or, the, or negative imprints, challenge, you know, painful imprints are a part of the interweaving of our day-to-day -day experience. And so I feel um, very, very honored and blessed to be able to share with you all the, the insights and tools and teachings from, from my teachers. So I'm trying to simply be an instrument for the wisdom that they passed on to me through this beautiful ancient science of Ayurveda. I've had three very, very strong mentors over my life with, within the realm of Ayurveda. And these tools have supported me and therefore uh, my clients and students over the last 12 years um, that I've been sharing with them um, in a very deep way to really free these cyclical patterns that we get stuck in and really help us reset the whole body nervous system, psyche, um, emotions, purifying the heart 
and reconnecting with the source of healing, which is our spiritual nature and divinity. And so um, I bow to these masters who have, who have shared on these topics and um, pray that this all supports you as well in your journey. So um, thank you for welcome Sheldon from Toronto. And thank you for writing in the chat. And Curtis says, I'm new to embedded trauma healing. I really appreciate an overview and learning about the pillars, foundations, basic knowledge. Beautiful. Well, you're in the right place. <laughs> and you know, you're all, you're in the right place if you are new to Ayurveda or if you have been studying Ayurveda for a long time. If you're a student of Ayurveda and you're in the right place, if you're challenged by having digestive imbalances and food sensitivities that you can never kind of get to the bottom of, you're in the right place. If you're having any troubles just with hypervigilance in your nervous system, feeling reactive, feeling like you dip into to fear or frustration or anger, like very, very quickly. Um, and you want to be able to connect more, you know, with your center and connect more with your, with truth, a higher truth and a higher perspective. Um, and in the, and in this workshop today, um, we, last month we started with like a very big overview of the, some of the ways that trauma, traumatic imprints affect our physiology. So if you want more of that foundation, you can always find it on my YouTube channel where I post these these recordings. And that's just Alicia, Alicia Lynn Diaz on YouTube. Um, so you'll find it on there. And that will provide the overview for that. But today I want to get into the three pillars. And so I always start these workshops with a little experiential component. So we can all be really receptive for the information and it will give you a grounding point for daily practices as you move through each day, especially each day between our workshop sessions. So you have a, a, a target and a goal and something to actually tangibly practice in between. So we'll do that as an opening and then we'll get into the three pillars and then we'll dive more deeply into pillar number one for today, which will all be around circadian rhythms and how to optimize your physical body to reconnect with a naturalness so that it's operating in a mode that is most calm and peaceful as possible. And there's many different ways that we reset that. And we'll talk about those today too. And then we'll have Q and A and closing prayers and wrap up for the day. So let's dive in first to a little bit of a meditative space. And I'm going to guide you through our breathwork practices and a, a gentle mantra meditation practice, and then offer a poetic meditation reading. And so come to a comfortable seat first, where you can feel like your spine is long and you're feeling relaxed. So you can take a couple moments to just roll the shoulders up, back and down, just releasing any tension out of the neck and shoulders, pressing the shoulders down towards the ground, maybe tilting your head a little bit side to side, releasing a little tension out of your neck, all the while taking comfortable, relaxed breaths and just gently, gently slowing the breathing. And just rolling the head just a little bit, releasing the neck. Any last final movements before you come into stillness? Go ahead and do those. And then bring your awareness down to your lower belly. So first, we're just going to engage a deep belly breath. You can bring one hand to your chest and one hand to your belly. This might be a helpful guide, or you can leave your hands in your lap. 
but you want to just go ahead and first take a big deep breath in. And as you inhale, you want to try to feel your lower belly soften into your hands, even expand into your hands. And then you want to feel your chest not move, relax. So often, usually about half of us in this session will be inhaling and puffing up our chest when we inhale, kind of like a Superman chest, but this is a reverse breather or an inverted breath. And so we want to train the body to do the opposite. So inhale, lower belly moves out, chest stays relaxed. So starting to connect with that lower belly movement, sipping air in through the nose, feel the belly expand. And as you exhale, feel your navel draw towards your spine, contracting in towards the spine. And as you inhale, it relaxes out like a nice, soft, big Buddha belly. And as it, you exhale, it goes out. So all the while, chest stays relaxed. Belly is the only part doing the movement. So take a few more breaths here. Inhaling, belly relaxes and expands. And exhale, navel moves towards the spine, expelling more air from the lungs. And each time you exhale, a little bit more and a little bit more goes out. That way, the inhale becomes fuller and deeper without you needing to force anything. Great. Two more breaths there at your own pace. And this deep belly breathing in the lower lungs really infuses your whole body with oxygen because most of the oxygen is in the lower third of the lungs. That's where most of the oxygen goes into your blood. It also stretches these little receptors in your diaphragm and they cause the vagus nerve to be triggered. And this causes a calming feeling to cascade in your body. So anytime throughout the day that you notice your breath becomes shallow or up in the chest, just take a moment to bring your hands to your belly and bring direct that prana and that energy down so it expands and relaxes you. And then you can come back to center more easily. So the second practice, it builds on the first practice. So deep three-part breathing, we will start in the belly, but then we'll move up to the ribs, expanding the rib cage out side to side. And then we eventually do reach the chest. So we inhale from bottom to top, inhaling belly, ribs, chest. Exhaling, chest, ribs, belly. And do it in these three distinct sipping breath parts to just connect with each section first. So inhaling belly, ribs, chest. Exhaling chest, ribs, belly. Inhale, belly. Ribs, chest, exhale, chest, ribs, belly. Two more at your own pace. Inhaling, bottom, middle, top. Exhaling, top, middle, bottom. Inhale, bottom, middle, top. Exhale, top, middle, 
bottom, always take a break if you need it, but then transition right into a smooth three parts. So like you're filling a pitcher of water from bottom to top and then pouring that pitcher of water out from top to bottom, it empties and smoothly inhale, belly, ribs, chest, exhaling, chest, ribs, belly. May these be the deepest breaths you've taken all day, all week. Feeling so relaxed as you inhale, belly, filling all the way up through the ribs, all the way up through the chest. Exhaling chest and ribs and belly. Inhaling belly, ribs, chest. Exhaling chest, ribs and belly. One more big breath, the fullest breath you've taken all week, filling all the way up. And when you get to the top, sip in just a little more. And then exhale it nice and gentle. You can always use pursed lips to just let it out really slowly, but gently. And then return to stillness and just notice the effect of these first two breath practices in a moment of quiet. Beautiful. Thank you for participating. Please use these breaths all the time throughout the day, whenever you need a little reset and use them every morning. First thing when you wake up or, you know, right after you use the toilet and brush your teeth if you want, but first thing in the morning, it really sets your breath for the day to be coming from center rather than reactive to the world. So the next practice is called the bee humming breath. And we do a little bit of a variation in Sanskrit. This is called Brahmari Pranayam, but the full practice isn't appropriate for everyone. So I'd rather personalize it. So we're gonna do a variation of Brahmari Pranayam. And the bee humming breath helps you tune into the subtle hum of existence. It really calms the nervous system and it builds on the previous full three-part breath that we just did. So basically you're gonna inhale belly, ribs, and chest. But when you exhale, you're gonna exhale with a humming sound. Lips stay closed, teeth are relaxed apart, tongue presses to the roof of your mouth, and you're exhaling the air from your nose. So you take a full deep breath in and exhale. I'll do a, a short version. You basically just pick a tone that feels very soothing to you. And it's like this very subtle humming of a bee. So we'll do three breaths together and then take a pause to just notice. So first exhale all the air out, making room, and then go ahead and inhale, belly, ribs, and chest, and then exhale with your hum three times at your own pace. Mm
I always feel that I could bathe in the soothing vibration for a very long time. <laughs> Hmm. And then the third, or the not third, that was our third breath practice. And we'll transition into a cross between the fourth breath practice and also a mantra meditation practice. So this practice is a simple chant that... Um, we also, it's a variation of a particular pranayama practice, but we're going to do a, a variation with just the mantra. In the full practice, you move your head in, in various movements, um, which may not be the best practice for everyone today. So we're just going to practice it as a mantra. And the mantra is Hari Om. So Hari Om, H A R I O M, or A U M, as Om is three different sounds. So, this practice um, does a few things. First and foremost, Hari is a very general term for God, for the divine. So, chanting Hari Om helps us connect to creator and the source of healing and the source of our bodies and the source of our heartbeat and our sustainer of all existence, our creator and sustainer. And so from a spiritual level, it's a, a very simple and beautiful yogic prayer, yogic chant to invoke the divine in our very current focus and remembrance. And then secondarily, as a yogic practice, um, Hari Om is circulates energy in a healthy way through our body. So the sound ha, H-A, ha, repeat it after me, ha. You should feel that in your lower belly where you were doing the first breath from. So ha, 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 do it with me. Ha, ha, ha. You feel your lower belly moving, right? So the energy is drawn from that lower part. The ri, ha, ri brings it up the spine and om circulates it. Ah, mm, so ah, if you do the sound ah, so om is three parts. A, U, M, ah, U, M. Mm. Repeat that one with me. Ah. Ooh, mm. and the ah do that one with me you feel it in your head ah and then the ooh sends the sound forward ooh even just the shape of the lips and how the air moves is ooh and then the mm circulates it back in just like you did with the humming breath you feel that one very internally so this circulates energy so Ha in the belly, re up the spine, ah in the head, ooh forward, mm, back through central circulation. So we'll do Hari Om um, in three parts, uh, three full Hari Oms, nice and long and slow, in the same way that you just did the breath, uh, the humming breath. We take full deep breath in with all three parts, and then we exhale. Hari Om. And so, some sometimes it's really nice to use this as a practice, as just a yogic practice that helps you prepare for meditation. Um, some sometimes it's really nice to direct that sound as if use that sound as if you know we've been talking a lot about inner child healing and you can chant this Hari Om as long as you want the longer the better all throughout the day <laughs> but you can 
imagine that you're holding your inner child so gently and, and chanting to that inner child in a soothing way. Or you can imagine that the divine mother or father is holding you chanting that in a certain, in, in a very gentle, reassuring way. Um, these are just ideas and suggestions. Um, we'll do the practice together now and consider that any of those options for your future um, implementation of that practice. So go ahead and first exhale all of the air out. <sighs> Exhaling it all out, making space. Go ahead and inhale, belly, ribs, and chest. Nice, full, big breath. And then exhale with Hari Om three times. Ah. Bathe deeply in that ocean of sound vibrating within you now as always, resonating softly, permeating the space of the heart. The ear that is tuned by rapt listening learns to hear the song of creation, first like a handbell, then subtler like a flute, subtler still as a stringed instrument eventually as the buzz of a bee. Entering this current of sound, the listening one forgets the external world, becomes absorbed into the internal sound, then absorbed in vastness, like the song of the stars as they shine. Anahate patra karane bagna shabde sharidrute shabda brahmani nishnata param brahma dhigachati So these practices, they bring us into naturalness. They bring us into embodied remembering. And that's what Ayurveda is really all about. Embodied remembering. Not just conceptual or mental thinking remembering, but really embodied remembering. How can my every cell in my body remember the truth of who I really am? 
and operate optimally? Or how do I respond naturally when this is not happening? <laughs> and so zooming out to the, the pillars of health in Ayurveda, we look at these three interwoven, integrated pillars that really are very, very hard to separate, but we'll do it just to conceptualize. But ultimately, they're fully interwoven, fully interlocked, um, and make up the, the fabric of our very existence in, in many ways, embodied existence. And so the three pillars start with looking at the biological pillar, which is what we will dive into how to optimize the biological pillar of physical health. And as we dive into that, that gets broken down into many different arenas. And the first arena is managing our energy in and out and managing how we sync up with the rhythms of nature day to day, month to month, and year to year. So these are, this is the topic for today, what we're going to dive into. Then we also need to look at for the biological pillar. So there's three pillars within the physical health realm. One is energy in and out, circadian rhythms. Two is optimizing the digestive fire and resetting the digestion and metabolism. So this second pillar within the physical realm is all about all has to do with how to optimize nutrition for my body type and honor my digestive rhythms and eliminate channels of elimination. And then the third pillar under physical health has to do with, this is another sub pillar, but has to do with prana, the how to understand and move the subtle, fine, vital energies of the body, because this is a network of a system in the body, a network of nadis, hundreds of thousands of nadis, which are subtle energy channels, also known as meridians in Chinese medicine. So these subtle meridian channels get blocked. And, and it's just like when you have a kink in the garden hose and the water doesn't come out or a clog in a pipe in the house and everything backs up. Um, these, the energy needs to be able to travel into all the areas. And if it doesn't, it basically suffocates those organs, those tissues, those areas of the body. And they start to do crazy things when they get suffocated and they start to not function appropriately. So those three pillars within physical health are what we're going to explore more deeply um, in today's session and the next two months. We'll go through physical health pillars. So circadian rhythms, managing our energy in and out, optimizing digestion and cellular metabolism, and the vital and energies, um, promoting the flow of the vital energies. So zooming back out, that was all under the physical one. Again, hard to separate anything, but we're going to try just for learning purposes. And then we have the pillar of spirit and spiritual healing. And we dove into this uh, quite a bit in our last month's session as well. And we won't talk as much about it today, but uh, not in an as in-depth way as we will in future workshops. But this spiritual pillar of health is the one that's missing in even the so-called natural therapies out there, even in the way Ayurveda is mostly practiced. The spiritual pillar is, has been lost and the uh, micromanagement 
of substances and physical nutrients and medicines has been exalted. But really, where does the, where's the real source of all healing? It's from our creator and the intelligence that's more subtle than DNA, that's more subtle than prana. It's the intelligence that is keeping us alive in every moment and is all around us pervading all pervasive divine energy. And so it's very important that we connect with that first and foremost, if we're on a healing path. Um, and just as souls <laughs> on this earth, <laughs> it's the most important, um, but in the realms of Ayurveda and, and healing and healing trauma, especially this is the source of healing. So we will dive more and more into that um, conceptually, but I, again, encourage you always to do the practices that we do at the beginning of our sessions as, a, as part of your practice for supporting vital energy, connecting to self and not being reactive to the environment around you. Very, first and foremost, we need to reclaim, you know, sense of self and connection to our creator so that we're at some kind of stable homeostasis to then be able to heal. Um, so that's pillar two in the big sense. And then finally, pillar three um, is the psycho-emotional pillar. And so this is in the realm of um, mind and emotions and how to navigate and deal with all the intricacies there. And within that, there's a whole world of your inner kingdom or your inner psyche and your subconscious mind and things that are frozen, stuck in time there, parts of you that have been, you know, stuck in time in these different places that this psycho-emotional part of you, whether it's seen or unseen, actually pulls the strings of your physiology. And so if there's stuff you know, tucked away in there, then uh, it can, and it's, and it's unconscious to you and it has a grip on your emotions or has a grip, um, has a, a veil that distorts your ability to, to um, experience fulfillment in life or to do your, your Dharma or to live in a Dharmic way and in a way that's true to your life's um, purpose and your uniqueness in a way that's fulfilling and serves others, um, in a way that's harmonious, um, the, the psycho-emotional realm invades all of that and it will get your attention. Um, if, if it can't get your attention consciously, it will get your attention unconsciously by creating and um, contributing to challenging health dynamics. So I've just seen this time and time again, um, where someone, myself included in the past, hit dead end after dead end, not being able to fully resolve their health challenge because they hadn't, um, they had exiled and gotten disconnected from unconsciously from a part of themselves that was very, very hurt in the past, very, very disappointed, hurt, fearful, whatever the case is. And that part, in order for you to move on, had to be kind of tucked away so that you could be resilient and keep going. And like, as a whole organism, make it past that trauma or whatever was the case. And so at some point that needs to be reprocessed in order for the whole system as a whole to, to calm back down and to be able to come back to a baseline of safety and healing. And so um, these three pillars, um, again, are, are intricately woven, um, but I'm putting them in this order for a reason, to take us on a journey that's very um, specific specifically cultivated, because if we can first and foremost reset our circadian rhythms, reset our digestion and our connection to our vital life energy, this creates a sense of safety in the nervous system. 
and for any healing and for any trauma related resolution, that has to be first and foremost. In fact, I've seen it go the other way where people dive very deep, very quickly to try to get rid of the trauma very fast. And they end up in a healing crisis or their physical body isn't able to actualize the change that they have energetically or mentally, and it doesn't fully translate. So we need to create the field. We're gardeners. We need to create healthy soil. We need to create a good location for this garden, sunny spot in the yard, meaning, you know, an optimal terrain for that transformational work to be able to take hold in. And so we start there with the physical foundation and a little bit more in alignment with that nervous system optimization from a more physical level. And then we reinforce, we'll reinforce the spiritual connection. And over that time, the more you're able to establish those things, it creates a natural ripening and a natural safety in your being that such that whatever might be, whatever mechanisms or past things might be stored or unprocessed, it naturally comes to the surface to be reprocessed. And you have more of the tools for self-care as that process happens. So this is a process I take my one-on-one clients through, which is, but we do everything a little bit more simultaneously, but, and, and go specifically into the resolution and into the reprocessing, but we first must take at least the first couple of months to establish this physical container to create a level of safety and um, calmness. So this is why the order of the pillars, and this is, um, you know, in this community setting with our monthly workshops, we can go into various topics that touch on that. And of course, if you are feeling like you want to go deeper into personalizing a transformational healing process for yourself, you can just reach out to me because I do have some one-on-one space available for that. Um, and my email is just hello at alishalindiaz.com, or you can just write to me in any other way that you're connected to me. Um, so Let's, with that as our overview, let us go into the circadian rhythm. So if you have your notes there, go ahead and take one kind of blank page or pick area of your book and draw a circle. And then draw that just a circle. And then with the circle, in the center of the circle, you're going to draw a plus sign. (laughs) So a big vertical line through your notebook or through your circle (laughs) and a horizontal line. And apologies that I don't have a whiteboard. I usually do these sessions in person, but it's nice because then if you're listening to this on audio, you can visualize it. So draw a circle and a plus sign. Okay, the horizontal line is the horizon, and that is going to signify the place where your horizon line crosses your circle. On the left side is the sunrise. And on the right side, it's the sunset. And so everything above the horizon line is daytime and everything below that horizon line is nighttime. So this circle is representing a 24 hour cycle. And the vertical line is signifying noon, midday at the top, 12 noon, or whenever the sun is the highest in the sky. And the bottom of that line is midnight, 
whenever the sun is the highest on the opposite side of the earth from where you are. <laughs> so we're going to first talk about the sun rhythms. So everyone has that visualized or drawn. So we're going to talk about the sun rhythms. So the solar rhythms govern your neurotransmitters, your hormones, your digestive enzymes, all of the biological processes in your body are governed as a human being by the position of that sun in relationship to your body. Now, this is why we experience jet lag when we cross, <laughs> when we cross, because different organs are turning on at different times. Different organs turn on and off. They, they wax and wane and nothing just turns on and off necessarily. It waxes and wanes. So there's overlap, but when we cross, um, when we get jet lag, it's because our body's oriented to a new place on the earth and the, and the sun and everything's in a different position. So it's like one organ is like, wait, I'm usually awake at this time. Wait, what time is it? And it's got to turn on at a different time. So it takes us time to recalibrate to where we are on the earth. And so we are so intricately woven into these rhythms. It's beautiful. So one of the first things you can do to just connect to a healthy rhythm is to be able to know where the sun is in the sky and to see the light in the sky or the ambient light if it's cloudy. And um, when the sun first peaks up over the horizon, it triggers a cascade of neurotransmitters, hormones, and hormones that start to wake you up, that have you start to feel alert. It also triggers digestive enzymes because you've been fasting all night, ideally. You fast all night. Your body's going through cleansing while it's fasting at night. And as that sun peaks over the horizon, you get your first spark of digestive enzymes and digestive acids and enzymes and juices flowing. So the whole metabolism starts ramping up at this time. And so, you know, within an hour and a half to two hours after you wake up with the sunrise, you start to feel hunger. And then you have breakfast, meaning you break the fast that you had overnight. And ideally, this is a type of food that doesn't bombard your digestive system, but that it just kind of um, gives you some kindling, so to speak. And we'll go into more of the, the food and digestive optimization next class. But again, we can't separate any of these pieces because they're all so intricately woven. So just as the Um, to support the blood sugar, but not to tax the digestion, to give us a little energy and to keep the things rolling, all the metabolic processes rolling. So sun rises, it gets higher in the sky. At some, at a point you shift from the mellow energy of the morning, which is more, um, more cuffic in nature, cuffic meaning more, um, more grounded and earth and water-based energy. And it starts shifting into a more rajasic or energized time period. So around like that 10 a.m. mark is that everything becomes more, you start to get hone in and focus. You start to um, get into work mode, so to speak. It's harder to just sit and meditate at that time because meditation happens when you're more lunar and more calm. In the early morning, there's a gentleness about the environment. As soon as 10 o'clock hits, you start feeling a little bit more like, all right, I got to get on with my day. Is that true? Do you guys feel that just inherently? as we're tuning into this rhythm. 
my partner and I noticed when we go, we go for bike rides sometimes around the river around town. And when we would go in the early morning and people would be out for their walks and, you know, everyone says hi in the morning, they're like, relax. They don't really seem like they have anywhere to be, but they're out, they're breathing the fresh air They're, you know, they make eye contact, they wave. And then as soon as 10 o'clock hits out, if we're still out on our bike, as soon as 10 o'clock hits, everyone's, no one's looking at you anymore. (laughs) They're all like tunnel vision. They're like running, they're on the phone, they're listening to their, you know, podcast, (laughs) whatever, but they're not saying hi anymore. (laughs) It's so interesting. Like if you actually observe the world around you in accordance to these rhythms, you'll feel it not only internally, but you'll notice it externally. Um, So then 10 o'clock rolls around. Now we're getting, the sun's getting higher and higher in the sky and it's getting closer to noon. Now this is the peak time of the day where you have the most mental capacity and the most digestive capacity. So your digestive capacity is not limited only to food. It's limited to the digestive capacity of your mind of taking in information, which is another reason why these live sessions, I had to switch from, I was trying to alternate to accommodate all of our time zones, but I noticed I wasn't as sharp in the late, you know, early evening as I could deliver them at this time of day. For me, this is the 10 a.m. to noon kind of time frame. So I wanted to deliver you better classes. So <laughs> to put it during the time that I'm most focused and that hopefully most of you can join still. So this high noon time is when we're the most productive. And this is when our energy is really moving outward. So, right, everything above your horizon line is when your energy is outward. Your eyes are open. You're engaging with life. You are, most people work during the daytime. And then in the evening, overnight, our eyes are closed. Our energy is internal. Most of us are sleeping, hopefully. If you're not, then we got to talk about how to reset that rhythm. But this is where the body's in receiving and integrating everything from during the outward movements and engagement. And so this rhythm is inherently interwoven with the cycles of the breath. So everything is microcosm, macrocosm, macrocosm, microcosm. You are a microcosm of the environment, of the nature, and you are governed by these rhythms. You cannot, if you work against the rhythms, you're swimming upstream. So this, I started losing my, I got so wrapped up and I saw someone pop in on the chat. Okay. Blessings. Namaste. (laughs) Okay. I'm back. See if I can get back into my rhythm. So energy out, energy in. So all of our energy is digesting the world around us. Our digestive fire is digesting the world around us through our five senses. So everything you see, everything you taste, everything you touch, everything you're doing, all your mental faculties, all your thoughts, everything's very active and alive during the day. So all these impressions are coming in and you are producing out. So back to the breath, this is what I was tying it to, is that microcosm, macrocosm. So when we do our breath work in the beginning of the session, we're inhaling and that inhale is the same as the bottom half of your circle. It's the same as nighttime. So you can label that on your circle Nighttime, inhale, in breath. So as soon as you fill up your lungs, full, 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 deep breath, what comes next? You exhale, full, deep. This is your daytime. This is that upper half of your circle 
on your graph, on your diagram. You're exhaling, you're producing, you're giving, you're offering, you're engaging. And this is why by the end of that exhale, by the end of the day, you're like, how much more do I have left to give? And then it transitions into a big inhale overnight. So this is mini microcosm to the greater macrocosm. And then these cycles continue through the lunar cycle every 28 days. And then through the 365 day, you know, grander seasonal cycle of the year and even grander to the cycles of your lifespan and then and onward and onward and onward until what we call the yugas or the massive time periods that all of creation and existence and the universe goes through but we'll just bring it back to the 24 hour sun cycle. (laughs) So about midday after midday, so that 10 AM to 2 PM period is what we call in Ayurveda, the Pitta period of time. And Pitta is associated with fire. And so that's when the digestion is the highest, but it's also when our productivity is highest, our focus is highest, our doing is the, the max. So um, majority of majority of our work day is right in the middle of the day, right? For a standard business day. And that early morning from sunrise until 10, so usually roughly from 6 to 10 a.m., that's what we call in Ayurveda the kaphic time period or kapha, K-A-P-H-A. And that's associated with that calmness and that more of that relaxation. That's also if we sleep past the sunrise, why we, if you feel groggier and groggier, heavier and heavier, because if you sleep past sun, sunrise, that what's called tamas or that, that energy that draws within gets heavier and heavier. So we want to wake with the sunrise at least, if not a little bit before, to catch that wave of, of bright energy. So we don't feel as lethargic and we can use the calmness of the morning for our morning routine and for getting ready and doing it in a nice pace. And then our energy naturally moves into productivity and doing. So then from 10 to two pitta productivity and doing now from 2 PM to 6 PM is the third part of the cycle. And this is called Vata. And this third part of the cycle, Vata is V-A-T-A. And Vata is, is responsible in the environment. It is responsible for movement. Vata is the air and ether element combined. So this movement, you know, we think of circulation in the body. We think of the wind moving through the trees um, and rustling leaves. But it's also just simply the movement of the daily cycle. So it is the movement from day into night. And it's the movement from night into day. So from 2 to 6, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. and 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., both sides of your chart, are, are governed by transition because they're just gearing up for the transition from day to night and from night to day. So Vata governs the sunrise and the sunset. Now, how this often gets experienced in the afternoon from two to six is our energy starts feeling a little bit scattered or we get antsy to move. It's hard to sit in one place and keep doing or producing. So some people they'll either feel like they need to go out and go for a run or a hike at that time if they haven't moved yet for the day. Or some people just do the opposite and they crash because that energy is moving in their system and it it kind of builds up. And so that's when they get that afternoon slump. And um, that's when they try to take another coffee break or take a nap (laughs) sometimes, but it's, it's all because of that transitory energy that comes on again in that part of the day. 
Um, so we have six to 10 kapha. We have 10 to two pitta and we have two to six vata. So that's just a brief overview of daytime. But those three elemental cycles happen also at night. They just go internal. They become inverted in a way. So after the sun sets, that two, sorry, six to 10 p.m. now is kapha time. So that's the same as the morning, but it's inverted. Instead of a calm energy that kind of brings us into the day, it's a calm energy that withdraws us into ourselves and into sleep. And so what happens during this period is actually, you know, the normal um, metabolic processes of your body releasing melatonin in that middle of kapha time, usually around 8 p.m., ish is when melatonin gets released into your bloodstream and melatonin makes you feel calm and draws you within. It helps you sleep. And so most people override that natural occurrence of melatonin and they push through it through artificial means because our eyes are so turned to the, the sun and to light natural light and natural sunrise and natural light helps us feel alert and awake. And it tunes us into energy moving out. And then when we do a lot of, um, artificial lights and screens after the sun sets, it just gives a false impression into the nervous system and it overrides your melatonin or the melatonin is still released in your blood, but then your body also releases cortisol to try to keep it back up. Cause it's like, wait a minute, I'm confused. There's still light coming in. So it, it creates more of an agitation in the system, which disturbs sleep. Um, so we'll talk about more of what, how to manage that and what to do, but this is just conceptually first. So six to two, I'm sorry, six to 10, 6 PM to 10 PM is where that energy starts drawing within, starts drawing internal, right? That's kind of like when you want to cozy up on the couch with your loved ones or loved one, you know, your kids, your, your honey, like you want to, it's like when energy starts to go internal, or I'd say for adults, it starts to go internal for kids. They get a second wind and they start agitating you during that time. Right. Um, but, but this is what's the natural kind of flow in the body. And then from 10 PM to 2 AM is the inverse of the 10 AM to 2 PM. So now we have a period of time where, um, that pitta or that fire that was going outward and producing and engaging with the external stimulation and also ingesting food and turning that into nutrients and energy. Now it's going internal and it is processing all of those imprints from the day. And it is digesting and cleansing your body um, from anything that it was exposed to during the day, toxins, or just normal metabolic waste. Cause your body is always needs to eliminate is taking in new, new nutrients and eliminating. So from 10 PM to 2 AM, um, this is what's happening. Body's cleansing and processing and integrating stimulus, stimulus from the day. What happens when you override the, the normal cuffic time. So the, the normal cuffic time that melatonin is trying to draw you within, have you go internal when you push through artificially stimulate the nervous system and stay up awake past 10, a few things happen. One is you override your body's ability to cleanse. So that night you miss out and then toxins will build up unless you do something about it the next day. Um, so you start to accumulate um, waste products in the body when you stay up. Secondly, your body is trying to 
do its natural process of integrating all the stimulation from the day. So conversations, decisions that you made, um, things that are still open loops that you need to finish, all of that. If you stay up past 10 um, and the later you stay up, the closer to midnight, what happens is it creates, it can create more agitation in the system. So you start, the mind starts consciously working on all of these things, which then lends itself to anxiety over, you know, your mind overworking and over chattering, continuing to keep you um, awake and not resting and rejuvenating. Then also what happens is the later you stay up um, and you artificially override those signals is that um, you tend to get hungry again because you're still awake and then your blood sugar drops again and you should be sleeping. So you shouldn't need to eat, but because you stayed up late, then you're like, oh, I'm going to just have a snack. And then now your body has to digest (laughs) the food that you put in and that overrides the cleansing mechanism because now the fire, that pitta fire has to digest the food that you ate in the middle of the night or late in the evening instead of cleansing. So the liver turns on in that 10 to 2 PM, the liver turns on and it's cleansing your blood and doing that. But if it has to produce more digestive juices, then it's, it's not able to go through that cleansing process. Does that make sense? Um, Again, I will create a, we'll talk about what to do with all of this, but you, I first want you to understand what these kind of different sections of the day are and how they go awry from 10 PM to 2 AM is that internal pitta. So all of that energy is going internal and cleansing and integrating and reprocessing and rejuvenating. The other thing that happens is with trauma specifically is if there's those early childhood imprints and distortions um, and hurt experiences, those have gone unprocessed. And the more time that goes on, the more you integrate or you, the more you interact with an environment through this veil and the more the things in your environment trigger the trauma and make you feel re-traumatized um, by the people around you, or it distorts and disturbs your ability to discern who are the people I should be spending time with or not. Right. And then sometimes it creates scenarios that are, um, that take, take more, uh, mental bandwidth, for example, and create more challenges and problems and hurt feelings or whatever the case is. And this adds to the load of what needs to be processed in sleep. So as time goes on, as the days and the months and the years and the decades go on where these things are kind of accumulated in the psyche and in the physical body. And Ayurveda says all emotional experiences, hurts and and traumas that go unfelt So if you didn't have the re emotional resourcefulness or, you know, especially with childhood, you, it's a developmental kind of trauma. You did not have the emotional resourcefulness to properly digest and process whatever situation had happened. So you couldn't feel it. So you had to compartmentalize it to somewhere in your being to deal with later when you had the resources. Um, and so Ayurveda says that unshed tears crystallize into the tissues. It almost creates like a subtle energy scar tissue, if you will, but that is easier to soften and resolve maybe than physical scar tissue even. Um, yeah, it's all healable and, um, can be melted away just by the process of softening, safety, presencing, compassion, and healing. 
but at the time it becomes crystallized and it crystallizes into the tissues or into the organs. And so when the body is holding that burden over dec- you know, years or decades, especially, um, it gives more to process. So this is why sometimes in dream time, there's disturbed sleep, disturbed dreams, um, often symbolic dreams that might have nothing to do with what you think consciously the thing might be about, but all these weird, you know, kind of different symbols, characters will come up in dreams. And most people don't know how to deal with that. So they just stay awake and distract themselves, but they're all still there. And that just adds to the load. Think about when your computer is, you know, has multiple programs running 25 tabs on three different windows, you know, of your web browser and how everything just starts working slowly. Eventually the computer just needs to be reset and reboot. Or if you keep the computer on for days and weeks and you never close out all those different applications or different windows and never do a software upgrade or never do a reboot, right? This is what we are demanding of our body as the years go on and and the, the decades go on. We demand this of our body and then we wonder why we have pain or we wonder why we can't eat that food we used to love and used to have no problem with or why we can't move as freely in our physical body and do the activity that we used to love to do. Well, all this stuff has just built up and you know, it doesn't get reversed overnight. We, the whole realm of even holistic health and wellness industry is funded on, you know, short little transformational quick fixes. And if you just do this, you know, little thing or take this herb and eat this diet, it should, it's going to fix everything. And then people do it for, you know, I tried that diet for months or years or days and it didn't make me feel good or it didn't work. And then we get this mentality because our, our consciousness is wired for it today to jump from thing to thing and to really just be dabblers instead of people who are really, really committed to, you know, uh, a level of mastery and refinement going very, very deep. Understandably so though, because we're getting the information we get bombarded with is quick fixes. And so, you know, Ayurveda and and these yogic sciences offer us deep and profound ocean of wisdom and a vast ocean of wisdom that we don't just dip our toes in, we have to submerge fully and surrender fully to the ocean. Nature will never, will, will, will not fail you as long as, you know, as long as you're listening to her, as long as you're communing her with her in this way. Um, she is relentlessly giving, 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 no matter how many trees you cut down, she's going to still produce life. That's just how nature works. So with your body and your physical healing and well-being, please don't give up and don't be allured by the little shiny objects of quick fixes. And don't be enrolled in this way of thinking that it, it has to work like this, or I'm going to give up on it. I've honestly seen too many people out there in the world, just give up on Ayurveda altogether because they put it in the box of this little thing, just like any other modality. It's not a modality. It's, it's a vast context where that all of the modalities actually fit into with their own perfect time, place, and application. So it's, it's not a modality. It's not just something that you go to an Ayurvedic nutritionist and you're told to eat kitchari every day and it's going to fix all your problems. No, actually kitchari cleanse is not appropriate for everyone. (laughs) It's not, you know, and 
nothing is appropriate for everyone across the board, maybe except for prayer, <laughs> but even that's unique. <laughs> breathing, breath work, but not every breath work perfect for everyone, right? You're a unique individual. And part of this is not just about collecting information for you to um, apply a steps, steps and tools. It's about communing with yourself so deeply, understanding your unique and beautiful nature and how you're the entity of you relates to this vast, beautiful existence around us that we're a part of. And every single one of us is different in that manner. But we all are a part of these rhythms. And so we all are a part of these unique cycles and these day-to-day rhythms. So let us continue 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. Fire cleansing. Now what happens 2 a.m. to 6 a.m., Vata takes over again and is responsible for that transition from night into day. So it slowly starts waxing or waning from night into day. One's waxing, one's waning as they pass the baton to one another. And this is why before sun before sunrise. So in many of the ancient meditation traditions, 4 a.m. to 6 a.m. is when you're in the temple doing prayer, meditating, doing those practices because, because of thanks to Vata, the veils between the worlds, um, this, you know, the physical world and the spiritual world are very thin. And so it's a time of, of quiet and it's a time of subtle energy that as it gets ready to transition to all that outward moving energy, it's like you're still connected to the internal energy, but it's getting closer to the light, getting closer to that um, awakening. And so, you know, the earlier not the earlier, the better you want to still get a full night's sleep and feel rested, but a little bit before sunrise, if you can wake and do a, you know, your own lineage prayer practice, yogic breathing practices, uh, gentle contemplation practice, you know, drink water, eliminate, you know, have the body just open and ready to receive the day in a connected centered way that's where this time period lends itself to at least the, the latter portion of that time period. But that 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. is governed by Vata. It's a transitionary period. And um, a lot of times in terms of the dream world, you know, we have, we remember more of our dreams in that kind of time period, like that 2 a.m. realm. And, um, And because of rajas, which is the kinetic energy active component, which is very inherent in vata, it can sometimes stir things up and create a restlessness in the mind, especially if you are the type of person, you know, especially with highly sensitive empathic type of people, this can be the case where it's very easy because we're so sensitive, we have a tendency to follow the external environment that's louder and more bombarding versus the subtle internal environment. And sometimes the external loud environment ends up being just the thoughts in our mind. So the thoughts in our mind, you know, can try to be the leader of us. And that creates a problem when you're governed by your thoughts and your to-do list, (laughs) it creates, you know, or you're governed, you, you allow the mind and its fears and its quirkiness and its nuances to guide the way it's going to lead you from fear. It's going to lead you from, um, fear and it's going to lead you from reactiveness and it's going to lead you from defensiveness because it, it's on guard. And so, very important that you lead from self, not from mind. And 
in future classes, we'll go through the discerning. I have an, a, one class, one of our workshops outlined specifically for um, discerning between self and not self, <laughs> all the different ways and secret kind of um, convoluted ways that not self tries to show up and pretend itself, <laughs> but self. And so one of the easy practices to do is just before bed, if you do have an active mind like that and a lot of things on your plate, just write, do a dump list and write it all out and then close the book and put it away. And whenever the thoughts arise, you come back to mantra. You can come back to Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari Om. We have a little song with Hari Om that I taught, I learned in yoga school. And it's just this sweet little melody. Hari Om, Hari Om, Hari, Hari, Hari Om. And you just sing that over and over. And that one prayer is simple and you give your mind something to chew on because the mind is constantly trying to eat. It's voracious. It has a voracious unending appetite. So if you constantly engage it, and let it eat, at least give it food that is supportive for you. <laughs> give it the highest food like mantra versus giving it food of more worries. Or if it doesn't have any food, it's just going to make things up. It kind of regurgitates all of its stories that it tells, and then it eats those. Ew. So don't let the mind do that to you. And then it dictates how you feel and all these, all this nonsense. So may we give the mind the highest food of, of mantra and of, you know, divine contemplations and peaceful contemplations and redirect it. And then during the rajasic time of the day, the productive time of the day, well, you give your mind the, okay, what am I going to do? Let it be a problem solver. Let it check off its to-dos, let it do its thing, but in the proper time so that your whole day isn't governed by the insanity of the mind. And don't worry, you're not insane. It's just the mind. Just know we all have a mind and all the minds are a little bit insane. <laughs> So we want to come more from true self, from soul, from spirit and identify as such. And then the mind can be in its right place as an ally to that, but it has to be trained to do so. Just like you train your dog, just like you train your dog, you want a cookie, it does something bad and you just, or, you know, it goes off leash and you're trying to teach it to heal. You're like, no, no cookie. Keep focus on this cookie right here. Cookie right? You want a treat. And the treat is the highest food. <laughs> mantra. <laughs> Beautiful mantra repetition. And it's not a bypass. It's a training. And then at the times where the mind does really need to focus on something or a different part of you, we're going to talk about all of those in future workshops too, like very specifically how to honor and um, bring resolution to the different parts that are trying to get, they're all vying for your attention. So the first step is just to train the mind to, um, feel safe in your presence and to have different times in your circadian rhythm that it can have an outlet. Cause that is very important. And then it won't be bypassing. And then later, once there's an established level of safety and groundedness, well, then we need to learn the nuance of how to interact and engage with and pacify these different parts of ourself that do need healing. And that's very, very legitimate. Okay. So now we have a, a nice overview of the circadian rhythm. And I just want to offer you a few insights specifically on how to put this all together and the practices that you can do each day to kind of establish that rhythm. And then for those of you who want to dive even more deeply into uh, an immersion with this, um, it's all going to depend on interest. Um, I, I told you guys a few months ago, I think it was before winter, 
there were, we were thinking of doing a women's circle. I'm so sorry for any of any of the, the males on this call. Um, but a women's cert, we would do a, many of the women wanted to do a, a women's circle for specifically for, for healing in that energy. And so I was thinking if those of you who are interested in doing more of an immersion around circadian rhythms, that we would host uh, a women, an immersive women's circle around that. So only if you're interested, let me know. And we can put, put that together. Um, kind of like a sweet little virtual retreat style where we would meet over um, a couple of weekends and implement some stuff in between. Um, and we would just go deeper into these practices in a way that you could really embody them and learn them step by step. And then again, for those of you who want to dive into a more one on one and get very personalized practices for your specific ailments or health challenges or whatever challenges, um, you can also reach out to me for one on one counseling, regardless of you know what we do for a group setting. So. Um, that's available to you as well. But for now, let's go through just basic overview of putting some pieces into place to optimize circadian rhythm. And I didn't say to, if you are interested in the, in one-on-ones or in the group, women's group program, immersive program, email me at hello at alishalindiaz.com. Hello at alishalindiaz.com. And all of those will be below, linked below this video as well, if you're watching this on a recording. And I feel like there's one more thing. And if you're not registered, everyone who's on here live should be, but if you're not registered um, to get the recordings, um, go to alishalindiaz.com and click the button that says trauma healing and that'll register for you for the workshops. And then I'll also, will send an email out with um, inviting you, the women into the women's circle and also letting you book uh, a one-on-one -on, -one on my calendar if you're wanting to go deeper into the one-on-one -on -one work. So that'll all be in email and linked below the recording of this video. Okay. So first step in optimizing your circadian rhythm is waking as close to the sunrise as possible. So that's going to vary. It's based on where you are in the world and the time of year, but just noting, you know, they have a lot of sunrise sunset apps. You can get them easily on your phone just to look at the time. And sometimes I do if I get, if I get really off rhythm, like if I travel or for whatever reason, get off, off rhythm, you can use an alarm, but a very gentle one. I actually use this little sports watch <laughs> that has such a quiet sound, but it's not jarring. And, um, I set my, this very, very gentle sound. So it doesn't jar me awake. Mm -hmm. And usually when I set an alarm, my body wakes up three to five minutes before it goes off. So you want to get to that place that your consciousness will just gently wake you up. And if you're sleeping in way later than sunrise, then you just move it back by like 15 to 30 minutes a week where you just slowly start to get up sooner and sooner and sooner until you're able to get to sunrise. And this is also going to very much have to do with your evening routine and when you go to bed. So we'll talk about that too. But in terms of just a practical way to get back onto rhythm, I use a very, very quiet little alarm. And the thing that happens with this is it, it only beeps for one minute straight. There's no snooze, nothing. So if you sleep through it, you're not, it's not going to, you're not going to wake up from it again. So what I do is my backup. And I put my phone, because I don't like to sleep with it next to my bed, I put it on the other side of the room. And then I set that alarm for five to 10 minutes after the watch. This is only when I need to get back on schedule. Otherwise, my body just normally wakes up without it. But the little gentle one goes off. 
And you know, I have to get up or that thing is going to go loud on the other side of the room. (laughs) It's going to blare and jolt me awake. So I just am able to slowly get up and then walk across the room. And now I'm already up. So that's just one way to start resetting it if you want to use an alarm. But in general, I don't suggest alarms because they're just a little jarring. So you want to use that as a tool to just start to wake up earlier and earlier. Okay, so that's first step. Second one, in order to wake up early, we got to go to bed early. Um, So limiting artificial light from 8 to 10 p.m., So limit screen time. If you need to just read a regular book with very dim lighting, light candles around your house, do salt lamps, have salt lamps or a little, like those little twinkly lights, Christmas lights or fairy lights or something like have everything in my house and in our whole house transitions. Um, after it gets dark, we usually have just lights are dim. And we have strategically placed salt lamps all throughout the house. And those stay on day and night because they create a great ambiance. So as soon as the sun sets, we just slowly have all these other lights that are kind of already on. And then we use the ambient lighting in the evening. And that just will help your natural melatonin come back into, into alignment with rhythms. So, um, second, these will go into more of the food tips next week in terms of optimizing, but eat more of your food during daylight (laughs) and eat less if not, if not at all when it's dark. So the bottom half of your graph sunrise to sunset, try not to eat when it's dark. This will optimize. Some people like to call it intermittent fasting. It's like, that's a trendy thing now, but it's like Ayurveda has been saying this for, for centuries, thousands of years. Try not to eat after sunset. Drink herbal tea. Drink, you know, have brothy soups or, you know, have it light or eat your dinner as close to sunset as possible. This will just optimize the cleansing of your body overnight and you actually wake up more alert in the morning and you sleep better. You sleep better. So again, more food tips will be in the next class, but give yourself permission to all of the um, times above the horizon line, energy out, all the times below the horizon line, energy in. Do something for yourself in the evening take a bath, soak your feet in warm water, massage them with oil. You know, don't feel like you have to be engaged and doing so much after dark, write a dump list, get the stuff out of your mind, listen to a guided meditation, listen, do some, do a gentle movement practice, stretch, you know, those types of things. These are all going to enhance your natural rhythms, walk on the earth, look at the sky, look at the moon when you're able. We didn't get into the lunar rhythms or the seasonal rhythms, but looking, contemplating the environment actually in the same way that your eyes connect with the sun and it governs neurotransmitters, digestive enzymes, hormones, in the same way, looking at the moon also governs for a female bodied person, it governs the hormonal rhythms. Just by looking at the phase of the moon, you're able to see it. So apply these subtle and profound sciences in your life, live in accordance to nature. If you live in the city, get out to the countryside, get out of the psychic energy of the city at times, spend day in nature at least once a week, Go look at, walk in your, in your yard or in the neighborhood park, look at the plants, connect with what is coming up at different times of the year or going dormant at different times of the year, you know, even throughout the annual cycle, this is the trees do this every year, the 
after the fall time, which is the same as sunset, the trees shed their leaves and all their energy goes down into the roots and they build these root networks with each other. And then in the spring, after winter, the energy comes back up into the tree. It goes into the buds. The spring produces buds, which is the same as the sunrise. It responds to the sun in the sky and then the leaves get fuller and fuller and it produces fruit in the summer. So we are inherent part of these rhythms. So just by you looking and observing this, you start to understand yourself better. Your body starts to operate more in harmony with naturalness and, you know, natural light, exposing yourself to as much natural light and grass and natural foods and vegetables as possible. We just started um, in February, in the last couple of weeks, we started a bunch of little plant starts, veggie starts indoors in our dining room <laughs> next to the big window that gets a little sun with a little grow light on there too. And then we just prep, started prepping our garden beds and we built a greenhouse over the garden so we could plant them. So we just started planting them yesterday because this is the new moon and we like to, it's good to plant your seeds on the new moon. So this is one of the ways that we stay in touch with naturalness. And if you don't have space for a whole big garden or anything at home, you can sprout sprouts on your counter. You can grow, you know, you can have a shelf dedicated to some little plants in your house. There's so many things. You can grow medicinal herbs and pots at home and commune with the, the energies of these plants. You don't have to wait only for, you know, special supplements to be created or to take them in pill form where you're so disconnected, you've never seen that plant. Literally, you can grow the plant and watch its leaves grow and blossom and just commune with the plant. I had actually my dear colleague, dear friend of mine, who's apothecary this is, um, he told me many years ago, we went to Ayurveda school together and he told me many years ago, um, because he practices bioregional Ayurveda and tries not to, you know, focus on only herbs and supplements that have to travel around the globe to get, you know, to get to you. He started teaching his, his clients and his patients as an herbalist, how to grow the plants himself themselves. And then they didn't even have to cut the plant, eat the plant, dry the plant, powder it, nothing. They just grew the plant and they received all the medicinal benefits just from being in the energetic field of this beautiful plant. The, the, all of the blood pressure regulation, all of the nutrient, you know, all of the, the things that he was helping them work on in their health, where he could have prescribed, not prescribed, could have recommended that they take, you know, all these capsules of herbs and tinctures and balms and everything when all they needed was one tiny seed. You know how tiny these seeds are? They're like them. Have you ever seen a mustard seed? They're so tiny, a gigantic kale plant that will produce like weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of food from one tiny little seed. It's just amazing. And you have that same intelligence in your body in your being. So all you have to do is create the right environment, create the healthy and optimal environment for your physical body, for your emotional body, for your mental body, and for your spiritual self to flourish. And first and foremost is by syncing up with these circadian rhythms, these sun governed rhythms of each day and just starting to notice, you know, preparing for our class for next month, just starting to notice as you sync up your sleep cycles and your energy out and energy in cycles, how do you start to notice your appetite respond? How do you start to notice a shift? So We'll end on that for today. I hope that was enough conceptual and practical knowledge for you. 
it's in some ways very anticlimactic because I'm not sitting here telling you just do this, this, and this thing in a big rah, rah way. And everything's going to be perfect. You know, it's like, this is a lifelong relationship. As long as you're in this body, you're going to have a relationship to nature. Start your relationship with her now. Listen to her subtle cues more deeply. Just like this poem spoke to us, our meditation poem from the beginning of class. First, like a handbell. Then subtler, like a flute. Then subtler still as a stringed instrument eventually as the buzz of a bee. So we start, we need to first engage with the more gross, obvious things like an alarm clock and waking at a certain time and sleeping. Cause if I'm not already doing that, that's how I need to work with that. But then I start to naturally arise with the sunrise and I wake up before my alarm and I feel alert and fresh. Yeah. My mind might be chattering a little bit, but I can easily redirect it towards my mantra. Okay. And then subtler still listening, listening, listening to this hum of life buzzing within your every cell. And then you learn how to move that energy into every corner of your being. And then it creates enough safety and you're tuned in enough to listening that when it comes time to listen to those hidden parts of yourself that have been hurting for a very long time, you have the subtlety, the compassion, the softness, the curiosity to listen and it resolves without in so much fanciness. <laughs> yes, there's tools. Yes, there's refinement. But it starts with you listening to nature. So please, for this month, listen to nature. Report back to us. Let us know how your connection with nature went and how you're able to listen to her rhythms more deeply in your own body, in your own appetite, in your own alertness, in your own nervous system and sensitivity. And, and then we will dive deeper into this physical pillar next, next month going into Agni and digestive optimization. Thank you for your hearts. I see your hearts and your, your messages. And I'm going to look in the chat to see if there's any other questions for today. And then we'll wrap up with closing prayers. I know, just know that I always set this class to be from 10 to 1130. And, but I always allow for two hours total just for the flow and for questions. Maria says, thanks so much. I've been trying to wake up before sunrise for a while, sometimes with success, others not so much, but this was a good reminder. I was reading that the energy before the sun rises improves memory and concentration and mental health. Absolutely, Maria. Thank you for sharing that. So true. And I hope that some of the, the practices shared um, support you and being able to sustain that. And Curtis writes, I've learned to distrust simple, quick tips. Absolutely. Reality is complex, never appreciated fully. And even the parts we can appreciate or become aware of, even that takes lots of time and effort. Thank you. Uh, nice reflection. Oh, beautiful. Thank you for that reflection. That's very sweet. Um, great reminders. <laughs> Kevin said, I have 25 tabs open on my browser. <laughs> Great reminders on personal health journey. Wonderful. Stephanie, thank you for your sweet reflections too. Um, yes, daily rhythms and energy. 
Okay. I'm glad. I hope this inspires simple shifts. Um, yep. This isn't today. Wasn't a list long of very specific to do's, but rather just some encouragement around listening and that relationship and just, you know, giving yourself permission to not be so bombarded by the external demands and loudness, but to give yourself permission to listen more deeply and to know that that's the most productive thing you can do. That that's, you know, sometimes you feel like, oh, I don't, I didn't get enough done today. I don't, I don't deserve or want to soak my feet in a hot bath or take a bath. Like, but really it's the most productive thing you can do because what does it do? It helps you tune in to the subtler energies. And as you tune into the subtler and subtle energies of nature, you can tune into the subtler and subtler energies of the divine and of the guidance guiding you in your very heart, giving you the answer to every question you seek. And the decisions are made on every turn on your path. It's all here, but that is the subtlest voice. So to turn in, tune into that voice, what a gift, what a gift. So we'll just wrap up today. Thank you all for your, for your beautiful comments. I'm not reading them all aloud, but I see them all and I read them all. And I thank you all. Uh, it's an honor and a pleasure to serve you. We will wrap up with a closing prayer. Loka samasta sukino bhavantu, sending blessings and prayers to all beings and all existence. Oh, Sue, you are here. Oh, I'm so happy to see you. And Om Shanti, may peace be with you and all beings remembered in embodied remembrance. <laughs> So take a deep breath in with me. Exhale all the air out. Full deep inhale and exhale with our prayer, the yogic prayer. Loka samasta sukino bhavantu loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu O Shanti 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 Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace. Lots of love. Thanks for being here, Caitlin. Thanks for being here, everybody. I hope this was valuable for you. I welcome your questions. Please email me hello at alishalindias.com. Send me your questions or to any other platform that we may already be connected to. I'll send you, um, you all an email with some of the links that I mentioned um, and also a prompting if you're interested in, in the women's circle immersion um, around circadian rhythms and all of that, um, we can do a deep dive. I'll put that in the email as well as if you're interested in any one-on-one -on -one deeper work for your personal situation. So I'll put all those links in the email and below this recorded video. Thank you so much for being here. I can't wait to see you all next month, first Wednesday. Make sure you mark your calendars. Same time, same place, in same Zoom room every month. <laughs> Thank you, Alicia. Your face, Stephanie. <laughs> Blessings. Lots of love Thank to you, you all. Thank you. <laughs>